Well, good morning. My name is Michael. I am one of the pastors here at Cedarbrook Church, and uh, I love a good story. Not only do I love a good story, but if it's a really good story, I love to retell the good story, and that's what I get to do today. I get to retell a story from the Bible um, that is such a good story. It's so good, you guys. And um, it has everything that you'd want in it. There's a person that is uh, broken down. They, they, they've been crushed by life. And then they meet Jesus, and their life is transformed. And I, I can't wait to share what that looks like to you, because it's kind of part of my story. Uh, I, I wasn't necessarily just broken down by life, but once I started reading my Bible and understanding who Jesus was, I couldn't help but to be changed and then go out like this person does to share the story with other people. And I, I didn't even know that there was like some etiquette that you had to have before you invited people to like read the Bible with you. Like, if they didn't believe in God, like, you weren't supposed to invite them. I didn't know that. I thought that would be the perfect person to invite to read the Bible. I, or if they were already going to a church somewhere, like, you're not supposed to invite them to read the Bible with you. Like, I, I didn't know that either, right? Uh, so I just went around and started inviting anybody and everybody that, to, to read the Bible with me because I thought it was fascinating. And, and I, it transformed my life. I just wanted to tell that story and invite them into it. And that's what we get to see with this story today, where Jesus is going to meet a woman at a well. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this story. You're like, oh, yeah, the woman at the well. I, I, I kind of remember that. It's kind of weird. They talk about stuff. I don't really get it. Um, yeah, same here. I was like, really had to do some work on this one. But once you get the work in, it's so fascinating to see the transformation that's going to happen with this woman at the well because she meets Jesus. So you ready? Ready to hear the story? I, I, we're just going to jump into it today. Um, John chapter 4. John chapter 4. So if you've got a Bible or you want to turn on a Bible, open your Bible, whatever it is that you do, I'd love for you to do that. I uh, strongly encourage you to have some kind of Bible that you can follow along with, um, or you can always uh, follow along on the screen. And just to set up a little bit here, there's a lot of things that are going to be talked about and referenced from this part of the Bible. And there's kind of a lot of this Bible, right? There's a lot on this, and then this is our story right here. So understanding this is going to be really helpful to understand this story. Now, I can't go through every bit of it. I would love to because it's fascinating. But I just want to give you a little bit of understanding. It's going to help in, a little, in this. So there's a couple groups of people, and they don't get along at all. In fact, they're family members <laughs> that don't get along very well at all. You see, this group of people came from one person, right? This couple, Abraham and Sarah, and then they had kids, Isaac, and then they had, he had kids, and he had Jacob, and, and then that became a nation of people called the Israelites. So this Jacob guy, he was transformed, and he got a new name called Israel, and then as his descendants grew and became more and more, become the Israelites. Now, through time, they uh, grew to such a, to, to such a group, big group of people that they started to have their own kingdom. But that kingdom, they didn't get along with each other very well, and that kingdom ended up dividing into two different kingdoms. And you, you had a, a, a northern kingdom, and you had a southern kingdom. And the southern kingdom had the place where God's presence dwelled in this place called Jerusalem, in a specific place called the temple. And that became the source of the place where they would worship. Now, the northern kingdom, well... They never had a king that was really good at all. Never did anything good in God's eyes. And so they were kind of despised by that southern kingdom. And they didn't have a temple to worship in. At best, all they could do is go to this mountain and this well that was provided by their ancestors and passed on to generation to generation. That became their place of worship. And then they started just fighting against each other about what place is the right place to worship. And that sets up the storyline that we engage with Jesus and this woman at the well. And if you've never really read through this part of it, of the Bible, 
um, I encourage you to do that because you will find that there are many times that people have met God at a well before we get Jesus meeting someone at the well. It's super cool and super nerdy, but you know, that's me. So let's, let's get into the story, and we're going to see that there's some, some tension going on between Jesus and some of the religious leaders at the time. John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and make more disciples than John, though Jesus himself wasn't baptizing them. He, his disciples did. So Jesus left Judea and returned to Galilee, right? There's some tension going on there. He's growing in popularity. The John they're referencing is this guy named John the Baptist, right? Huge following of Jewish people, and now Jesus is having more and more of those people following him. So a lot of tension there with the religious leaders. They're not sure what to do with him. Uh, They've had some problems in interacting with Jesus, but that's not the big part of the story, is it? It just sets up that Jesus is leaving that area of Judea, which would be in that southern kingdom area, and he's going to move up to where the northern kingdom would have been. Verse 4, Jesus had to go through Samaria on the way. No, he didn't. He didn't have to. Yes, I'm disagreeing with the Bible. The point is is that good Jewish people would go around Samaria, They would take the extra time to avoid Samaria. That's how much they disliked the Samaritans, right? You ever heard the term good Samaritan? It's an oxymoron. There's no such thing as a good Samaritan, right? In their mindset. So they would go around Samaria. But Jesus, no, no, he had to go through it. He's intentional about what he's going to do. So let's see what he's going to do. Verse 5. Eventually, Jesus came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please, give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, Well, you are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? That's a really good question, right? That was a great question. What is going on here, dude? Don't you know how this works? You're a Jewish guy. I'm a Samaritan gal. Like, we do not converse. So what's happening? Jesus is intentionally starting a conversation because he's going to reveal something about himself and then he's going to help transform her in a whole new way. Did you pick up on the time that they gave? Noontime. Pretty specific, isn't it? All right? So when the Bible gives you details, pay attention. What about noon would be important to understand here? Well, in their culture and society, the time that you go to the well to get water is not noon, not the hottest part of the day, not when the sun is directly over down and pressing in upon you and scorching heat just makes you more and more dehydrated and thirsty. No, you don't go then. You go in the morning when it's nice and cool, or you go in the evening also when it's nice and cool. It becomes a social gathering where a lot of the people, a lot of the women would gather and talk with one another as they're drawing up the, the, out of the well, the water out of the well, right? She's deliberately going at a time when no one else is going to be there. I really think there's a metaphor that's being seen here. She herself is going out in the hottest part of the day with a scorching heat, dry and beaten down by life. She's going to go to this well, hoping to satisfy that thirst. Why are you asking me for a drink? We don't get along. 
We're not supposed to do this. Here's another indication that she's an outsider of her own society, but also from the Jewish people. We don't do this. Wait to see what happens. Here's what Jesus is going to say to her, inviting her in to seeing something in a new way. Verse 10, Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. I know you keep coming to this well every day and then you come in at the hottest part of the day and you draw it up, but it's not satisfying, is it? No, but I can give you something where you're not going to need that jar anymore. You're not going to need this vessel to draw up water anymore. I'll give you this living water. It's, it's a, the idea is really connecting back to the Genesis story, the beginning, the garden story where this water comes up and it starts watering the garden and it's just always there and it's lush and green and you can have that kind of life. Big metaphor? Absolutely. Does she get the metaphor? Kinda. Kinda. In fact, I think she gets it more than her first statement or her first question gets at. So let's take a look. Verse 11. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. And this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you are greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Seems like she missed the metaphor, but I think she's kind of picking up what Jesus is laying down. Right? How are you going to get this water out of here? You get no way to draw it up. You get no vessel to draw up this water, no jar, nothing. How, how can you then give that to anybody else? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob? Do you see that this, this place is very sacred to her, right? This is a place of, of worship. It's a place um, that she goes to to try to get to, to get the, satisfy something that's draining her in life. I think she's asking this question because she's kind of getting it. This is what I call a thirsty question. Do you know what a thirsty question is? A thirsty question. In, in the Bible, thirst for something, really is a, a metaphor for desiring to know God more. We talked about this a, a few weeks ago as I wrapped up the image of, or the I Am uh, series with, with the bread of life. Like, hunger is this desire to know God. Thirst is also that way, this desire to know God more. And, and we have thirsty questions, and she has a thirsty question, right? These, these are questions like, even if you don't believe in God, in fact, sometimes our thirsty questions are what we use to then not believe in God, to show that God doesn't exist, right? If there is a good God out there, how come all of this bad stuff is happening in the world? That's a thirsty question. I want to know and understand God more because I don't if this is who God is. Or, or if you are a, a follower of Jesus, you, you have thirsty questions in your life. The, the things in life that beat you down, the circumstances that, that suck the life right out of you, cause you to ask thirsty questions. Why God? Why this? Why me? Why now? Why can't you? Why don't you? Those are thirsty questions, aren't they? She has a thirsty question. I think in her whole life as she's been crushed by her circumstances, as we're going to see what some of those are, she has got some thirsty questions. So how is Jesus going to respond, right? Is, is this going the way that Jesus intended it to go? Let's, let's find out. Jesus, uh, verse 13. Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Do you starting to see a little bit of this connection of how this metaphor of water has now turned into this 
idea about life, a life that we can't get from the things that we see in life, right? The, the places in life. It's only about where we get it from this person of Jesus. He's going to give this water, and then that water becomes something that bubbles up in them. You have a life, but Jesus is going to give you a, a, a greater life, something that's greater than you can do on your own. This eternal life thing, um, it's gotten me thinking, right? Eternal life. It's, some concept is, uh, for me has is, is always been like, well, when you die, then you get to go to this internal life, right? You get to then live forever. And I always thought like, well, if it's eternal, isn't it just always there? Like it was there long before I was here. It's going to be long after. And, and, and somehow Jesus is saying, yeah, exactly. You get to tap into this life of God that, that he wants to give to you right here and right now. You don't have to wait till you die to experience that. It's, it's there all the time. How do we engage with that? Jesus is offering a way, right? Taking in this water that springs up into eternal life. Well, what does that look like, Right? How, how do we get this? I mean, these metaphors, it just gets my head spinning, right? And, and it does so for this Samaritan woman as well. She's going to engage with this conversation in a deeper way. Verse 15, she wants this water. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Do you understand why she doesn't want to go to that well anymore? Alone, feeling abandoned and broken, pressed down by life. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to go there every day either. I, I don't want to come to this well. This well has not been helpful for me. In all the places that she could go to to worship and meet God, this one has not provided the life that is satisfied that has become something that's bubbled up into her. Now, there's, a, there's an idea here about place, isn't it? And that's, that's where this conversation's going to go. But Jesus is going to get very relational on her. He's going to point out something that maybe not everybody knows or she doesn't think anybody else knows. Here's what he says in verse 16. Go... And get your husband, Jesus told her. Well, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're with, living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. I love this because it feels a little bit like he's going to make a judgment about her lifestyle and then encourages like, hey, you actually spoke the truth. You could have lied, right? You could have tried to deceive me, but you chose not to. There, there's this trickle of living water flowing through her right now. Do you, are you seeing it at all? Because why else would she tell the truth? There's something going on. Now, she sees that Jesus must be greater than her ancestor, Jacob, because of what she's going to say next. And notice, we're going to notice how she puts this back, this focus back on a place of worship. What place should we go to that's going to help provide me to, in this life that's been pressing me down? How can I get healing from this life? What place of worship will be helpful, okay? So pay attention to what she is going to say. Verse 19. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped? Do you see? She's bringing up this debate. Where do we go? How do we worship? What place do we go to that's going to be the right place? I, I want this living water, and it must be connected to a place. And I think you and I, we, we've, we've done this, or we've known people that have done this. For, for my own life, I've had lots of places of worship, 
lots of different places, whether it was in a, a Lutheran place of worship or a Catholic place of worship or a Baptist place of worship or a non-denominal place of worship, like some place that I had to go because that was going to provide something in my life that's not going to make me feel so abandoned and crushed down and drained from life. But it's not about the place. It's not about place. It's about the person. There's a, there's a person that we're to meet that those places can invite us into meeting this person. And maybe you're sitting here now going, maybe Cedarbrook will be this place. Maybe, maybe Prairie Lake will be this place. Maybe watching online in my place will be this place that I will get some healing. But it's not about place. It's about who you're invited to be with. That's what Jesus is doing. He's inviting her to meet him. Just happens to be at a well, right? Just happens to be at that place. But that's not the important piece. So here's what Jesus says, and it gets a little confusing, but you can see he's tapping in on something that she did, something she said, the truth piece of it. He's inviting her in to take the next step. You were truthful, right? You spoke the truth. Now go this next step. Here's what he says in verse 21. Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship while we Jews know all about him for salvation comes through the Jews. That's God's plan the whole way. If you read this part of it, you're going to see he keeps committing himself to this group of people to bring about restoration for all people. Okay? Verse 23. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming. You know, the one who is called Christ, when he comes, he will explain everything to us. I want you to take the next step. You were true, right? You're truthful about it. You're there. Come, connect with God's spirit. This is the thing that's going to bring you life into your life. It's going to be like a, a, a living water bubbling up in you. All right, I want you to take that next step. And what does she do? She pumps the brakes. Like, this is, this is bigger. I don't know. I haven't figured it all out. But I know that the Samaritans are waiting for this anointed one. That's what Messiah means. Right? That's what Christ means as anointed one, someone that is appointed by God, chosen by God, sent by God to bring about not just understanding, but God's kingdom into this world and bring restoration. Samaritans are waiting for that person. The Jewish people are waiting for that person. So they're all joined around focusing on this person that they're all waiting for. Yeah, I know he's coming. When he comes, he'll sort it all out for us. So thanks for trying. I'll just wait for the Messiah. Now, for those of you that were part of the uh, I Am message series, these descriptions about, that Jesus used about himself so that we could learn more and more about him, well, the first one he ever utters is coming next. Meets a woman who is broken down by life, abandoned by people, and he's going to reveal who he is to her, the one she is waiting for. Here's what he says. Verse 26, Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. The one you're waiting for to explain all these things to you, I am here, I am here now. I am the Messiah, I'm that anointed one. This has a huge, profound change and, and change and transformation that goes on within her, in, in her. There's a little bit of a description, but pay attention to what she does and what happens. I'm going to give a little giveaway here. Pay attention to the jar. She brought a jar out to fill up the water, right? 
so that she could have water throughout the day and all of that, pay attention to what happens there. This is where it gets really cool. Verse 27. Just then the disciples came back. They were shocked to find Jesus talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking with her? The woman left her jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Did you see what happened in the jar? She left the jar, right? Left the jar by this well because she met the person. Why, why do you think she left the jar? Are you picking up on it at all? Okay. She left the jar because she doesn't need that jar anymore. She's become the jar. Is that cool? She's become this vessel that now has this living water bubbling up in her. She becomes that jar. That's a fascinating, right? And what does she do as she's got this new life bubbling up in her? She has got to go and tell people about it. She can't stop from telling them. people that have cast her out, that probably ridicule her, people that she's deliberately tried to avoid, she is now running out and telling them, you've got to meet this guy. I think she's convinced this is the Messiah. I really do. But she does it in such a way that she invites them to see for themselves. Could he be the Messiah? This transformation is fascinating. She leaves the jar because she becomes the jar filled with living water, bubbling up in her, and she's got to share that message. You know what's cool about this transformation? Is it didn't just happen one time, way back to when Jesus met with a woman at a well. Now, I, I've, I've met a new friend of mine that she's had a woman at the well type of meeting with Jesus, some life that has happened to her and beat her down and caused her to ask these, these thirsty questions and try in different places to satisfy and finally comes to meeting with Jesus and now all she can do is invite more people into that. Her name is Deb Creaser Kip and I can't tell her story. I want her to tell her story. So let's listen to her story. Hi, I'm Deb Creaser Kip, and I'm going to share part of my story with you. At approximately 8.30 a.m. on Monday morning, March 5, 2018, I received a phone call that my brother had been killed in an accident. Earlier that morning, he had driven his truck directly into the lane of an oncoming semi. Now, any other time, we might have thought that this was an accident, that he just wasn't paying attention. But that wasn't the case, because we saw the note that he left on his truck seat. And the months and the weeks leading up to this point were filled with mental illness, incarcerations, suicide attempts, suicide threats. So we knew that this was not an accident. This was not something that any of us would have chosen for ourselves, for sure. I swore at that time that I would become, in the, become involved in the mental health process because there were so many circumstances leading up to this point that I felt could have maybe helped us avoid it. But the biggest thing for me was that I fell to my knees, and it wasn't to pray to God. It wasn't to ask God to heal me. It was to yell at God. I was so angry with him. How could he do this? How could he possibly have let this happen to my brother? He was my baby brother. That next year, I truly spent searching, wondering, what was my purpose? Where was I supposed to go? Who was I? I didn't even know who I was. I didn't like myself very much anymore. I truly felt like I was abandoned. 
but I know now that that's not true. I know that God was there. I believe that things are orchestrated always for us. So we stepped out in fear and we started to explore a mission trip to Honduras in January of 2022. And that was the first time that I felt truly that God was calling me. And I kept thinking, what does he want me for? Who am I? I am, I have made so many mistakes. I have done so many dumb things in my life. And yet, we all know that God's grace is so amazing. He just forgives us, and he always, always wants us. We went there to drill a well, and the people that we met, our Honduran counterparts, were so strong in their faith, and it just made me realize that I could have that too if I truly wanted it. So we came home from that trip, and I decided I'm going to get that. One way or another, I was going to get it. So I bought a study Bible. I bought some books. I started coming to small groups here at Cedarbrook. I think I was going to three at one time, and I dove right in. Obviously, I got a little bit overwhelmed because, you know, there's only so much you can absorb in your brain at one time. But I knew that something was happening Something was really, truly changing in me. And I was so passionate about going back to Honduras that we made that become a reality in October of 2022. Nine amazing, faith-filled women with strong agendas for women's ministry were all called together. And I don't pretend to think that I was the person who brought that group together. I know 100% that was God putting us all in that place at the right time. But a mission trip, as it turns out, is life-altering for me. I, can, I came home, and I felt like I still there was still so much more that I could do. I don't know what that is necessarily. When my brother passed away, I swore I was going to do something with the me mental health system. I was going to get involved. I wanted to make changes. It didn't feel right. It felt messy and it felt dirty to me to get involved in that until I came home from my second mission trip. And I think that God was just holding me back, telling me, it's not your time yet. You're not ready. I think I would have been too angry to really talk about those things, to try to make changes, because there were so many hurts still festering in my heart. So I want to read this last part. I recently read the words, God will never waste pain that's offered to him. And I love that. I love the fact that God will never waste your pain. He will never waste your heartache. He will never waste your loss. He will never leave you or forsake you. He will use the bad to create good. It's easier to hold on to the bad stuff, to try to keep God out of the picture. I mean, that comes, that's human nature, right? That's, that's first for us. But when we do, when we bring God into the picture and when we really step out in faith with him. We need to trust his heart, and that's when we start to heal. We trust his heart, and we trust that he has a plan for us. And that's where I am in my journey right now. That's an incredible story, isn't it? And you could see that transformation. And, and what happens with the woman at the well? She becomes the jar, the vessel, where this living water boils up and Deb Creaser Kip as well, right? You can you see the transformation. Now she is this vessel. No matter what place that she's in, she's got this living water bubbling up within her. And we just want to give you an opportunity today. Maybe life has beaten you down. And, and we invite you to come and meet Jesus, the one that can fill you up, turn you into that vessel. Now, this song talks not about water as much as it does about wine, being filled up with this new wine, which is this same idea, same concept as water, but it's about fruitfulness and abundance, that you can have that kind of life always there with you. So however you need to 
receive this song, receive Jesus into your life, I invite you to do that. Maybe you want to stay seated. Maybe you want to stand up. Maybe you want a time of prayer. I encourage you to take this moment now to meet Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one that gives you his living water. Her story doesn't end with her. She goes back into the town and she tells more people to come and meet not just a Jewish guy, but this man that she thinks is the Messiah, the anointed one. And then there are more and more vessels being filled with living water, and more and more jars filled with this new wine. Listen to what happens at the end of this story. Verse 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because of what the woman had said. He told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, they probably haven't talked in many, many days, said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard for ourselves, they have become the vessels. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. If you've become a vessel filled with this living water, I encourage you to go out and tell somebody. Tell somebody and invite them to come and meet Jesus. So how, how do you do that? Well, I'm going to give you a way to do that. We have the Easter weekend coming up where we're going to tell Jesus' story. We're going to connect Jesus' story with your story and make an amazing weekend to, a story to tell. So we encourage you to grab uh, the invite cards, one for yourself, maybe one or two for someone else that you know needs to have their story connected with Jesus' to- story. I encourage you to do that. I also encourage you to uh, take some time for prayer, all right? Uh, here under the cross, if you need some more time for prayer, we encourage you to do that. Guests that are here with us, don't forget your free gift. We want to send you out, not empty-handed, but with this gift. So go to the info booth as well. Thank you for allowing me to share this story. We'll see you next week.